Just like we have identified for ourselves an inner critic, we also have an inner ally. And this is that kind and supportive and compassionate voice. Dr. Cynthia Phelps, and I'm here to talk to you today about how to use the power of your inner voice to help you thrive and be happy. So I'll back up and talk briefly about the research that it's based on. It's based on something called self-compassion. So self-compassion is just like taking compassion and applying it to yourself. When we're suffering, it can be a lot harder for us to have a kind and nurturing voice on the inside for ourselves. Now, when I say inner voice, maybe you know what I'm talking about, maybe not. But when I say inner critic, people usually have a pretty good idea about what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just like we have identified for ourselves an inner critic, we also have an inner ally. And this is that kind and supportive and compassionate voice. So how do we do it? I think it's important to understand where our inner voice comes from in the first place. Most of us adopt it from an early childhood caregiver. So maybe it was a parent or a grandparent that was there to nurture us and However they spoke to themselves and even how they spoke to us can be ways that we internalize just unconsciously and turn that into our inner voice. It turns out there are some real barriers to creating an inner voice. And the first one, we may have no role model to teach us how to do this. People don't just go around talking and relating what their inner voice is saying to you. And so this thing that we've adopted, the inner voice that we adopted from the early childhood caretaker, that is usually the one that we have by default. Another barrier is that there's a lot of pushback in our culture around the practice of self-compassion, about being kind to yourself. When you're kind to yourself, our culture tells you things like you're weak. And if you look at the research, it couldn't be more opposite. Another thing that I've heard people say is that, you know, if I'm nice to myself, yeah, I'm just not gonna be motivated to change or to get what I want out of life. I'm just gonna be lazy. And uh, this also is not borne out in the research literature. It turns out that people who are high in self-compassion have a better capacity to change, like create new healthy habits and then also sustain them. Uh, another thing that people uh, sometimes say is, well, I don't want to be kind to myself because it sounds narcissistic or it sounds like I'm being self-centered, only thinking about myself. And it turns out people who are high in self-compassion are actually much better at taking care of other people. These are things as human that we all need. And so they're like the need for love, the need for security, um, the need for forgiveness. They're very uh, like central to being a human and you need them to be able to thrive. Here's a little example. I know you can't see very well, but we're gonna, we're gonna zoom in with a PDF on these. It is a set of about 16 characters that all have their own essential emotions with them. And so they are your role models to help you practice the self-compassionate language. And each of them has an essential emotion that is good for all of us to nurture. So you can't lose with any of the inner allies, 
but you might find that a few of them are specifically really great for you. And so right now we're looking at the artist and the core emotional need, the essential emotion of the artist is expression or the need to be seen or heard. Uh, and you can see each of these little descriptions has who is this inner ally, some examples of some language that you can then modify for yourself or take it as is. And then just a little bit more about what this inner ally has to offer for you. Uh, and then at the very bottom, there's also um, some other ways that you can conceptualize this inner ally. And so the artist is primarily expression, but it can also be playfulness, creativity, and bravery. So we've got these role models now, but one of the powerful ways of practicing self-compassion in your inner language and with your inner ally is to actually craft language specifically for yourself. So I call it making your inner ally phrase. Well, the first part is really identifying what essential emotion you want to work with. The next part is to choose kind of the beginning of your phrase. The next thing that you can consider while you're building this language is do you want to have something like a qualifier in there? And so because we have so many hangups in our culture about how uh, to use these phrases, giving yourself permission can really make a huge difference. And so the final things at the bottom here where it says check your tone and check your critic and feel it in your body. These are all about how you're judging if it's working for you. How to use these phrases? Two ways I wanna give you before we're done. One is that I want you to use them in a time of distress. So if you already have your phrases handy, you can put them on post-it notes or somewhere where you can access. You can use it when you're feeling not so great, some of those difficult emotions. But just like mindfulness and meditation, this inner ally, these phrases, this inner language, it's a practice. It's a practice to shift a critic over to an ally. And so it's something that you're gonna wanna do on a regular basis. So I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to talk about the inner voice and how you can use it for your own happiness.